In this video, we're going to be diving into the Exodus. Now, it's not just a book. We're looking at an event, a story, and maybe even an idea that shapes the rest of the entire Bible. As we overview the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we finished our last video looking at the book of Genesis, which concluded with Joseph and his family in Egypt. And it was one of the greatest rescue stories in all of the Bible. But now as we turn the page to the beginning of Exodus, we'll see that life has become hard, really hard for that family. It's large enough to be considered an entire nation, Israel. But something drastic is going to need to happen again in order to rescue them. See now, Exodus is a strange word, isn't it? It's the name of the second book in our Bibles, but, but what does it actually mean? It literally means to leave, to depart, to go out from. And that's exactly what happens in the story of the Exodus. The book of the Exodus begins that story. Israel being rescued from their difficult situation in Egypt and journeying towards the promised land. But more than just leaving Egypt, the Exodus is about God once again putting things right, taking his people and leading them to his place. To really understand the big shape of the story, we can think of it in a couple of parts. The first part is that rescue from slavery in Egypt. Then the story moves on to the people receiving the law and this marriage-like covenant between God and the Israelites. And then the third part is this wilderness journey, traveling from Egypt to the promised land. What happens to the people of God there? Let's start about thinking on that first part, the rescue from Egypt. In Exodus 1, we read about how things have turned. Joseph's family had multiplied, but then they died, as had all of those who saw them in a positive light. And this is what we read. Then a new king came to power in Egypt. Look, he said, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. We must deal with them shrewdly. Or well, they will become even more numerous. And then they'll join our enemies and they'll fight against us and they'll leave this country. So they put slave masters over them to oppose them and to oppress them with forced labor. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. If you've ever seen The Prince of Egypt, the film, then you'll know exactly what happens next. The people cry out, God hears, and God saves one little boy, Moses. And he calls Moses to lead his people out into freedom. After meeting God at the bush that didn't burn, Moses is sent to confront Pharaoh with a message straight from God. Let my people go. But the hard-hearted, hard-headed Pharaoh refuses. Time and time again, in total, God sends 10 plagues, 10 judgments, culminating in the death of every firstborn in every household. And yet even in the midst of this judgment, even in the midst of this death, God provides a way, a way out, a way to avoid that judgment and to find rescue and life. God says that you can take a lamb, kill a lamb and paint the frame of the door to your house with the blood of that lamb and judgment will pass over. It's where we get the idea of the Passover lamb from. And so it came to pass across the land of Egypt, there was much weeping and much relief, depending on which side of trusting God you fell. Pharaoh, at this final, um, at this final curse, at this final plague, relents, concedes to let the people go. But just at the last minute, he has a change of heart. And it finds the Israelites stuck between him and his entire army chasing them and the edge of the Red Sea. When all seems lost, God parts the waters, allowing the Israelites to cross safely while the pursuing chariots are swallowed by the sea. But you see, this is, this is something we need to understand, that the Exodus isn't just the story of them getting out of Egypt. 
It's about them going forward towards something too. And after that miraculous rescue, God leads the people to Mount Sinai, where he makes a covenant with them, a marriage proposal of sorts. And in Exodus 19, God says this, you will be my treasured possession, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The people accept God's proposition. They, they accept this entering into a special relationship with him. And God gives them the law, his instruction, his rules, his ways, his wisdom, starting with the Ten Commandments. Now, again, it's important to say and to recognize that the law is more than just rules. It's instruction, it's guidance, it's wisdom. It's a way to shape the people into the nation that God desires them to be. We often think of the law as something that restricts us, don't we? But actually, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that is the law. It's, it's the story of what life can be when you live in a relationship with your Creator and Saviour God. Now, it's during this time the giving of the law, that God also gives instruction on how to build a tabernacle, a tent, a place for him to dwell amongst his people. And that seems strange to us as modern re readers, but it's proof to the people that God is with them, that wherever he goes, they will now be able to follow. Perhaps particularly curious to us is the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is filled with strange practices and rituals and teachings that seem very odd to us. But it's again the continuation of this same story of the God who has rescued leading his people into life. If we give the book of Leviticus time to do so, it teaches us so much of what life with God is supposed to be like, showing us what a transformed life could be, transformed by his presence amongst us. In Leviticus, we read rules and teachings about how to give thanks, how to give praise, how to celebrate God, as well as how to purify oneself and how to make propitiation for our sins. The book of Leviticus helps us to see that having God really does make a difference in our lives. Now you'd think that everything would be plain sailing from that point, wouldn't you? But sadly, it's not. As the uh, Israelites journey through the wilderness, we see an awful lot of ups and downs. They complain, they grumble, they doubt, they even turn to worship a golden calf while Moses is up on the mountain receiving the law. And yet through it all, God remains gracious. God remains merciful. God remains faithful to his promise to rescue them and to deliver them into the land. In the book of Numbers, we see the people just there on the shores of the river Jordan, ready to enter into the promised land. But first they send out 12 spies. 10 of whom come back in fear, saying that the land would be impossible for them to conquer. And only two, two out of 12, Joshua and Caleb, believe God will deliver them. Now, because of this doubt, the people end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. All those who had witnessed the might of God in rescuing them from Egypt, they won't get to experience the might of God rescuing them into the promised land. And we have stories of what happens then. For 40 years, God judging them, but also keeping them and rescuing them from many difficult situations. Finally, we come to the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses addresses this new generation that has been born and brought up in the wilderness, the children of those who had doubted. And he reminds them in it of God's promises of God's rules, of God's wisdom, of what life can be like and what life should be like with him. He prepares them to enter the promised land under Joshua's leadership. You see, the Exodus story is more than just a story of escape. It's a continuation of God's gracious rescue mission, a mission that began in Genesis and carries on right throughout the rest of the Bible. It's the story of a faithful God leading his people through hardship, guiding them with his wisdom 
and dwelling among them and being to them a reward all in himself. So what do you think? How does this Exodus story tie into the bigger picture of God's plan for humanity? Are there any characters or themes that stand out to you? And what do you think should come next in the story as we journey through the Bible? Let me know your thoughts to those questions in the comments below and see you in the next video.